I want to ask you just one question about Ukraine and then and then sure. some of the, the stuff in your book, which is just extraordinary. Um, the former president has claimed that Russia would not have invaded Ukraine if, in his words, quote, our election was not rigged and if I was the president. Obviously, the election was not rigged. Do you believe that had he been in office that Russia would not have invaded Ukraine? Who knows, right? It's, it's speculative. I think the only person that knows why he invaded Ukraine when he did is Vladimir Putin. Mm. And there may have been signals along the way that he misinterpreted. Clearly, it's a strategic failure in what has been a devastating tragedy for the Ukrainian people. But I don't think that question's answerable. Had the U.S. not started to supply weapons to Ukraine and training as they did, do you think Ukraine would be doing as well as they are? Look, I do think it's uh, an accomplishment for President Trump to have begin sending lethal aid to the Ukrainians in, I think, 2017. I visited there in early 2018 to see United States training of uh, Ukrainian forces. I think those two things have made a big difference, and I'm glad to see that the Biden administration is continuing that. Right. President Trump did hold up the, the aid, which was voted right. by Congress. He As was... I talk about in my book. Right, That's yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things you said to Maggie Haber in, of The New York Times in an article about your book, you said about the former president, he is an unprincipled person who, given his self-interest, should not be in the position of public service. I mean, that's a really extraordinary statement. When you say he's an unprincipled person, what do you mean? Well, like, what are the fun fundamental, fundamental principles that guide you, right? And for, for me, it's country, you know, duty, honor, country, what I learned at West Point. And I never got a clear sense of what those principles were or are. And so for me... Do you think he has any? I don't know. So I can't, I, I can't, uh, I can't discuss it or opine on it, right? To me, to be president of the United States or any elected official, you have to have some core you know, a, a core base there. It begins with putting country over self. It begins with integrity and principles. And then it begins with being able to reach across the aisle and work with others to advance the na national agenda. And Donald Trump just doesn't meet, meet the mark for me on these things. The, the president obviously has gone after you. He goes after anybody who right. has spoken up in, in any capacity. He says that you, uh, you were weak, totally ineffective, and that because of you, he had to run the military. Was he running the military? No, he wasn't running the military. I was running the military as Secretary of Defense. And uh, look, I think we accomplished a lot of great things during the Trump administration for the military. We began modernizing the, uh, the, the services. We began advancing the national defense strategy, implementing that, pivoting toward China that I see as our strategic adversary. Uh, Warp Speed produced the vaccines. There was a lot of good work we did at the Pentagon. And by the way, I think the administration in general had some good accomplishments. We could talk about the Abraham Accords or, right. again, the vaccines, lower taxes. If Yeah, in the book, you're, you are very fair in uh, you give praise to the administration where you I think... I try to be fair. You think there, there, there is reason for that. Um, one of the things, though, that really stunned me in the book just overall is that the president did not seem engaged... I mean, when he was running for president, I remember interviewing him, and he was talking about, mm -hmm. in Iraq, we should steal their oil. We should surround... The U.S. military should surround the oil fields, steal the oil, and then, and then get out. Um, obviously, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. not a military plan. It doesn't seem like, while he was in office, or d did you get the sense that he... There was a big evolution of his understanding of military... of the military and of what is possible. I mean, he was talking about sending missiles, Patriot missiles, right. to take out drug cartels in Mexico. Well, look, I, I clearly can't speak about the four years because I was defense secretary for the last 18 months or so. But I did see a change, a shift in him and the behavior of the team around him uh, after he beat uh, impeachment in January 2020. I talk about this, yeah. right? I, I say how fresh troops come in, more loyalists coming in. It's a uh, it's uh, Johnny McEntee, the head of pers presidential personnel. Rick Grinnell comes in, Mark Meadows, others. That seems to take, uh, you know, some of these outlandish ideas to a new level. It was, it was more, it became more reckless. That was the change. And, and, and maybe it was due to COVID as well, right? The, the president was sitting on this great economy doing well, and all of a sudden COVID crashes in. It, it dashes that. It has a big impact on his electoral prospects, if you will. And I think all of that factored into this. Uh, and look, this is just me speculating as somebody who was there on the scene watching it unfold. But clearly something changed, and I try and describe that in the book. But it, that you saw that after the first impeachment? I did. That, that once he got through that, there was... We, we went to a new level. Uh, when you're sitting across from the president and he is suggesting something like, oh, shoot the Black Lives Matter protesters in the legs... What do you? What does your face look like? Well, that's the, clearly an extraordinary situation where I was just dumbstruck by it. And he was speaking to General Mark Milley when he a asked that question of, you know, can't you just shoot him? Just shoot him in the legs or something? And I was, you know, shocked by it. 
to, to hear this from the President of the United States saying that we shoot our fellow Americans in the streets of the nation's capital. And I think that... And, and not just... We're not even talking uh, police, national... He's talking about the U.S. military, like the US deploying military. the U.S. military. Right, active ten, ten thousand. He wanted right. 10,000 U.S. military forces outside the White House uh, because of protesters. Right, that's right. And look, there was violence. I, I believe in law and order. There was violence. Uh, people were getting hurt. Uh, people who were uh, protesting peacefully were not being allowed to do so. But the answer is not a heavy hand and certainly not lethal force. And so I think we were all dumbstruck. I, I think between Bill Barr and myself... And with General Milley's support, you know, we started putting ideas out there that law enforcement should lead this. And the military should, should back up only as necessary. And even then, it should only be the National Guard. And kind of walking him back off of this, uh, this, this notion of sending in the active duty military. The, the people around the president, you know, when he was campaigning, he was talking about how he only hired the best. From the portrayal you have of the, in the book of someone like Stephen Miller, who at one point is suggesting after uh, Baghdadi, I think it was, was mm -hmm. killed, uh, that you find his head, dip it in pig's blood, and parade it, ar parade it around. Uh, yeah, let's put the quote up uh, on, on the screen just so... Or you say, Stephen Miller suggested later in the evening that U.S. forces try to locate the ISIS leader's head so that we could dip it in pig's blood, which Muslims consider to be unholy and paraded around or some barbarous idea along those lines to deter other terrorists. I mean, again, that's extraordinary. Yeah, he made this quip, and uh, it was in the Situation Room while we were observing the attack on the big screens, and, you know, Millie and I quickly shot it down. But, look, I don't think the president was so well served by some of the people he brought in around him. And, unfortunately, he kept attracting people like that. And I think, you know, my job and the job of other cabinet members was to kind of help lead him in the right direction, to kind of give him the best advice we could offer in terms of a way forward. Look, for all of all the turmoil of the, four, of the Trump administration, there were a lot of good accomplishments. Again, if you're a Republican, you like lower taxes, you like deregulation, you like border security, uh, you like conservative judges on the bench. There were achievements, but too often they were, they were marred or undermined by the president himself with kind of that tough talk, the coarse language, the divisiveness. And what we need are leaders who bring people together, particularly in this day and age when I think the biggest problem facing our country is the extreme partisanship on both sides of the aisle. Yeah. Do you worry about what the president has done. I mean, this, this is, man, is the standard bearer still of the Republican right. Party. Um, as if you're a Republican, do you worry about what that means for the Republican uh, I, Party? I do. Look, I'm a Reagan Republican. I've worked for, 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 for Republicans my entire life, for conservatives. And in my view, we need to move beyond Donald Trump at this point in time. We need to look at for the next generation of leaders who can advance those same core Republican principles, right? And at the same time, grow the base, win elections, and, uh, and bring the American people together. We just don't have that right now. Yeah. Do you, do, I mean, does the Ronald Reagan par Republican Party still exist? I think it's out there. I think there are too many have been cowed mm. by fear of Donald Trump humiliating them, calling them names, whatever the case may be, mm. and we need to give them the space to grow. I think that party is out there. I want to believe it is out there because we need two competitive parties uh, speaking to the American people and bouncing ideas off of one yeah, another sure. and sharpening those policy proposals. Yeah, we, we are made better by having people, good people of different opinion, and good people can hold different opinions, and, and having a middle course worked out b between them. Look, I spent 25 years in D.C., right, working in Congress, the executive branch, all around. My observation has been that the best form of government is when you have split government, when you have both parties occupying either one of the two houses and the White House, mm -hmm. and then they have to work together to come up with enduring solutions to the problems that our country faces. You, you write about this in the book. You thought about resigning plenty of times. Uh, yeah. G General Milley thought about it as well. Uh, you guys discussed it. Um, you didn't do it. Uh, people criticize you right. for it and say, now you're writing a book, profiting right. off it. Why, why not resign while you were there? I, I hit this in the first few pages of my book, as we were discussing beforehand. It was the you know, I wrestled with this all the time, Anderson. I, it really tore me apart. And I tried to figure out what is the best thing for me to do. And for me, it came back to my training at West Point, duty, honor, country. And I thought the best thing for me to do for the country was to serve. <laughs> the best thing for me would have been to quit. And I, I got this line in my book that my wife used to say to me. Gonna, I was going to reference this line. It's a great line. No, she says, you know, as your wife, I want you to quit. Please quit. But, but as an American, I want you to stay. And I wrestled with that. And I, I ended up, you know, uh, calling uh, predecessors of mine from both parties. I mentioned before I spoke to Secretary Colin Powell. And, and to a person, they said, you got to stay. Hmm. Uh, you got to stay. And I, look, I wrestled with this. This is a tough issue. And I, for people to criticize me, that's fair. But I think they should also respect how I was approaching the problem and what I thought would be best for the country. The other factor was... 
I didn't know who was going to come in behind me. Mm -hmm. I'd seen what the president had done by replacing the DNI, the director of national intelligence, with Rick Grinnell. He had talked about doing it again. I was concerned about who might come in behind me. And, and look what happened, right, in the last two months of the administration. Yeah. Uh, Mark Esper, I appreciate it. Uh, the book is really uh, startling. Uh, it has a sacred oath, memoirs of a secretary of defense during extraordinary times. It is out tomorrow. Thank you so Great. much. Really Thanks, a pleasure. Jason. Thank you very much.